In the late 1970s, the anthropologist Daniel Everett was dispatched to an Amazonian tribe with about 350 members, intending to learn their language and convert them to Christianity. But what he realised about this language was something quite unique. It had no words for numbers. This tribe, because of their language, had no way of counting. The Pirahan are the only remaining tribe of the Mura people, and have had contact with others in Brazil for about 200 years, but they're still a mostly monolingual community. Their language is the only one left of its family, and it's known for its strange features. It can be whistled, cried, or used in muffled eating speech because of its tonality. It has no abstract colour words, it has an inventory including some pretty wild phones, but perhaps strangest of all is its lack of numbers. In 1980, scared that they were being cheated when trading with outsiders, the Pirahan insisted that Everett and his wife teach them how to count. But while that's going on, let me tell you about today's sponsor. Unlike with those Brazilian traders, you can rest assured that you're getting a good deal when you sign up to HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the biggest meal kit provider in the United States, who send you fresh produce that travels straight from the farm to your door in under a week. And you don't even need to be able to count, because all the portions are measured out and ready for you, making everything easier and less stressful. There are plenty of vegetarian, pescatarian, and fit and wholesome options, and with Hello Custom, you can even customise your meals. It's never been easier to eat your own way. And I know what you're thinking. Ordering all this food from HelloFresh, that must be really bad for the environment, right? Well, HelloFresh is actually the first carbon-neutral meal kit company, and nearly all its packaging is recyclable. In fact, according to a University of Michigan study, HelloFresh's streamlined supply chain actually reduces greenhouse gas emissions compared to regular grocery shopping. So use my link or go to HelloFresh.com and use the code POGCLINDEC70 for 70% off plus free shipping on your first box. Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. Alright, now let's check in on the Pirahan eight months later. So every evening in that time, Everett's entire family have been teaching the men and women of the tribe to count in Portuguese. And well, they've given up. Despite showing enthusiasm and enjoyment of the lessons, the Pirahan ultimately decided that the material was impossible for them to learn, as still not a single one could count to ten or even add one plus one. So it does seem kind of like because the Pirahan don't have numbers in their language, this fundamentally changes their ability to grasp the concept of numbers at all. And yes, this is sounding a lot like a theory which predates Everett's work by nearly 40 years. Let's talk about that guy, Worf. In 1936, Benjamin Lee Worf wrote his famous paper, An American Indian Model of the Universe, in which he discusses the relationship of the Hopi tribe to time. In popular culture, his idea has often been simplified to the catchphrase, the Hopi have no concept of time, although he never really claims this in the paper. It's kind of difficult to pick out what he does claim, actually, Worf is kind of a bad writer, but he does clearly believe that the Hopi experience time in a fundamentally different way to the speaker of the standard average European language, and he claims that the Hopi language contains no reference to time, either explicit or implicit. This was the basis of his theory of linguistic relativity, where from an individual's perspective, the world is different based on the language they are experiencing it in. Now, of course, the big problem with this theory is that it's... I mean, it's just not true, is it? Enter Ekehat Malotki, whose 600-page book, Hopi Time, lays out the Hopi concept of time, from their calendar systems to the grammatical constructions they use to express temporal relations in their language. But just while Malotki was laying the myth of the timeless Hopi to rest, Everett was finding what could be seen as new evidence for linguistic relativity among the Pirahan. But Everett's claims are not quite the same as Worf's. The theory of linguistic relativity claims that a person's understanding of the world changes based on the language they speak, but the case of the Pirahan inability to count is one of expressive capabilities. As Everett writes, he is not making a claim about Pirahan conceptual abilities, but about their expression of certain concepts linguistically, and this is a crucial difference. And lab experiments suggest that the Pirahan do have a concept of amount, being able to match exact quantities laid before them, but lack the system of abstractions necessary to gain counting or numeracy skills. So does language change the way you think? Yes, in some ways it does. The way you experience the world? Not as far as Everett and the Pirahan are concerned, anyway. This hasn't stopped Everett from being pretty heavily criticised, though. Because at a glance, it feels a little bit like Worf, doesn't it? 
an outside academic coming in and studying an indigenous culture, writing about how different they are from us, and papers steeped in mystification and racist vibes? Worf has racist vibes, I don't know how else to put it. Everett isn't as extreme, is a much better writer, is more careful with his words, but ultimately, is he just coming to a Eurocentric misunderstanding of how the Peterhan express quantities? Well, maybe? But just shouting Eurocentric at something isn't actually an argument. Sure, it's a bias to be aware of, but it does nothing to prove Everett and Frank's studies and lab experiments wrong. The real problem here is that Everett is the guy who knows anything about the Pirahan. We need a greater range of opinions, more experts, more studies, more experiments, and Everett himself wants academics to go to the Amazon basin and test his theories. So, is it possible that in 40 years time, Everett will get his own Malotki, who comes along with his 600 page book of how his life's work was a waste of time? Yes, it's possible. But I still think it's pretty lazy and anti-intellectual to respond to Everett as, say, Steven Pinker did, by saying, by framing his observations as an anti-Chomsky discovery rather than as an un-PC, Eurocentric condescension, Everett was able to get away with claims that would have aroused the fury of anthropologists in any other context. This doesn't respond to any of Everett's work, it just kind of dances around the issue. Like, this would be an explanation as to why Everett would hypothetically be wrong, but it doesn't show in any capacity that he is. As Everett responded when asked about Pinker's harsh words, shame on him. Wait, hang on, what was that Pinker said? Chomsky. What does Chomsky have to do with anything? Wait, whoa, Chomsky hates Everett, man. What's up with that? What, what happened here? 